Body Zero, Radical Preparation for the Return of Christ. Chapter Five, Dissolution. So let's go into the book of Luke now. We want to take a little look at Luke, Luke at Luke, and chapter one and chapter three to really expose what is at the heart of this book, Body Zero, and I believe what the Lord is saying to the to the global church and to the UK church as part of that, which is the call to repent as we've looked at, but specifically from denominational thinking and denominational uh, structures, thinking, allegiances, etc., etc. There should be a whole bunch of stuff that we agree on that we don't, and it shouldn't be okay to just say, oh, let's agree to disagree. When C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity talked about um, his conversion, really, as being the most reluctant convert in the whole of England, and that he was hounded into heaven by the great hound of heaven, one of the things he said, which makes perfect sense to me, is that Christianity can't be moderately important. If there's one thing Christianity can't be, it's moderately important. It's either true and therefore of utmost importance or it's of no value, it can't be moderately important. And that's really what I would put uh, the same logic on, whether it's to do with cessationism, whether it's to do with denominational thinking, whatever. Jesus is either who he said he is or he's not. And going back into Acts 2 in that early church in the upper room, there would have been no uncertainty about who he was. Well, uncertainty from a place of the disciples struggling to take in who Jesus was, but there wouldn't have been any kind of culture about, oh no, I actually think Jesus is like this, therefore I'm gonna worship a Jesus like that. And somebody else saying, well actually, I think he is okay, so I'm gonna worship. This can't be moderately important. And so the call to repentance about some of these denominational schisms, splintered forms of thinking that leave the world, who don't even know Jesus at all, thinking, what is a Christian? Who are the Christians? What is the church? Where would I go to find a church, to find solid teaching? And so I believe in this day and age, there's an increasing um, rising call to the forerunner prophetic ministry that's going to go ahead one small, one short step ahead of the return of the Lord Jesus, whether in our lifetime or not, to prepare the people for the return of the Lord. And listen to some of these words. And this is... This was the word of God to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who was the archetypal forerunner messenger, who spent 20 years in the wilderness for six, six months of ministry, the bright and shining lamp who was eventually beheaded by Herod. But in these initial words to Zechariah, this is the angel speaking to Zechariah in Luke chapter one, verse 12, sorry, verse 13. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, and I want to say, do not be afraid, church. Do not be afraid of the word of the Lord. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you'll, you should call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Another kind of bedrock of this book is this, listen, that the that the church, sorry, that the world will not be prepared for the return of Jesus until the church are prepared for the return of Jesus. And our calling, our command from Jesus himself was to go into all the world and to make disciples of all nations. And so making a disciple, as we've learned from the chapter on radical messianic eschatology, is to put Jesus the Messiah, the coming King, at the centre of all of our cultures and here we are hearing that the forerunning the message the forerunning messenger message is to prepare a people prepared for the lord flick over to luke 3 and listen to this this is a specific part and how it relates to denomination so flick over just a couple of pages to chapter 3 and verse 4 this is 
uh, John the Baptist preparing the way. So this is just like a fleshing out of that prophecy to Zechariah, John's, the fa John's father. In verse four it says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. This is the stunning thing. So John the Baptist is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy from the book of Isaiah, hundreds and hundreds of years before. And this is the word, so this is a quote from Isaiah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. Even listening to that, just reminded of that bit from what we've just read earlier in, in Acts when Peter was preaching at Pentecost and it said that all men came to a place of wanting to do whatever it needed to be done in order. So it's like this, this, this kind of pervasive, all-consuming move of God across the earth. And it does say, doesn't it, in, in the Bible that one day the glory of the Lord is going to cover the su surface of the earth like the waters cover the sea. And so the specific point about this here in Luke 1 and in Luke 3 with this messianic forerunning language about not just John the Baptist as a historical figure, but the spirit of Elijah that is the spirit of the holy God that we love and serve, that is also possessing us today, I believe, at this time in history as his children. It's to go ahead and it's to make straight those things that are crooked. It's to raise every valley and it's to bring down every mountain. It's to bring a level playing field to this denominational terrain that causes confusion and breeds unbelief and ultimately Christian cultures that aren't engaged with his return. And there's this specific point, so if you think about this language, that John, this is John the Baptist's call in the wilderness. You know, he's described as a voice crying out in the wilderness. But this, think about what he's saying. There's not, there's not a whole heap in the Bible for us to reflect on what he said. But he's saying here, that every valley should be filled, every mountain hill shall be made low, every crooked path shall be made straight. There's this kind of, um, leveling of the spiritual scene at the time and that's of course what happened when the Pharisees not just the Pharisees all of the other guys people that found salvation came to him there was this kind of a level playing field of what it meant to encounter Jesus much like Paul himself was leveled and floored onto that dusty road on the road to Damascus a crucial part a crucial part of the years ahead within this dissolution of denomination. And a key part of John's calling, bizarrely, particularly in this bit in Luke 3, was to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Sorry, that's in chapter one. Was to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. What an unnatural image. If you're a parent, if you're responsible for any children or young people, and you think, God, can I imagine what it must be like for my heart to need to be turned back to the child. It's such an unnatural image, isn't it? Such an unnatural picture. And yet today in the denominational spectrum of things, I believe that there's going to be a turning of the hearts of the fathers back to the children in terms of the fathers of denominations, the fathers who've been in a, entrenched in denomination for 30, 40 years, who've maybe, maybe led a church for all those years. There's going to be this difficulty, I believe, particularly with the fathers to conceive of a Christian messianic landscape that is not party to denominational thinking or ways of days gone by. And it's gonna be that forerunning Elijah spirit, John the Baptist type figure, the prophetic people as we've heard earlier in, to, in today's age that are gonna to help to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and follow suit into all that God has ahead. There's no need for denomination. A day will come where denomination is obsolete where the, the thought of it is an absolute nonsense. When Jesus comes back, can you imagine the church in different pockets saying different things about Jesus? You'll either be a sheep or you'll be a goat. You'll either be in or you'll be out. And one day, the door to the wedding supper of the Lamb will be closed and it will be too late. Father, we want to thank you that you are long-suffering. Your patience towards us is immense. And Lord, I pray especially now for those who feel stirring towards the dissolution of denomination, towards that future reality of the body of Christ where there are no divisions, there are no 
pockets of disagreement where there's no let's just agree to disagree. Lord, I pray that you would burst and lance that boil in the name of Jesus across every denomination. For the Presbyterians who don't believe in the gifts, I pray. For the Charismatics who don't teach the Bible properly, Lord, I pray that there would be a levelling. I pray that there would be a fresh sense of our own being poleaxed like Paul was on the road to Damascus. Lord, I pray that there would be um, courage and boldness in the hearts of those that you mean to go ahead of your return, whether in our lifetime or not, and I pray that there would be um, an uprising, Lord, that would make the Arab Spring look lame. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.